welcome to the special edition Monday DC Today, uh, where we kind of go through the long form uh, commentary that you're used to in the written form. And I want uh, podcast listeners and video watchers to get all that same information. Uh, there's a lot today. Uh, for one thing, the market is up 3,600 and... 40 points in the last four weeks. And so if that feels surreal, it's because it sort of is. I don't I don't know if anyone would say it feels that way, but that's just an absolutely monstrous move higher in the Dow in the last four weeks. And there's been, you know, some setbacks with that along the way. Um, and then now we had a big rally in the market Friday and another big rally today, uh, more than making up for the, the 550 point drop that took place uh, when, on last Wednesday in the market. So there's still a lot of volatility. There's still both up and downside risk in what the market might do on any given day. There's still people trying to time the market, getting their, you know, what's handed to them. Um, but as far as the overall view we have of where we stand, I'm not sure much has changed. There's a lot of unknowns, a lot of day-to-day uh, -day volatility, and a lot of intersection with both the unknown of monetary policy and the unknown of earnings outlook tied to recessionary risks. I will say uh, this, the overnight action last night, Sunday, the market opened uh, futures down 200 points. And then throughout the evening, it progressively got better. Uh, the Nikkei was up, I think at one point, 450 points. The um, Hong Kong index was up 2%. So you had a, a lot pulling things higher on the Asian side overnight. And then uh, this morning, uh, the Dow futures were up 170 points. And so there is both volatility day to day in the overnight space. And then we opened up about 80 today and just went progressively higher from there. Eventually, the Dow closed up 424 points, which is 1.3% on the day. Uh, the S&P was down in the morning. It opened up, it closed up almost 1%. And even the NASDAQ, which was up quite a bit, in the, uh, excuse me, down quite a bit in the morning, closed up almost 1% at 0.85. One of the things I have to get into, and there's a chart in the dctoday.com today. Um, I want to give a hat tip to Jim Bianco, who's a great macro uh, economic research um, analyst. And I was reading him over the weekend, the US dollar, the DXY index, you recall I talked about this in Dividend Cafe about two months ago. It had its biggest um, drop on Friday that the market, that the DXY market has had, the, the dollar, its value relative to a weighted basket of other developed currencies. It had its biggest drop in a single day since 2015, and it was the second worst day since the financial crisis. So I've been talking about this over and over again, that a um, reversal of dollar strength was going to be necessary to sustain an equity rally. And that uh, uh, excessively strong dollar, and more particularly excessively weak other developed foreign currencies, we're, we're creating a very difficult backdrop for um, equities to kind of find their footing. Well, look, the dollar had this massive drop on Friday, but it was still up on the week last week. So I don't know that you can interpret this as, okay, the a reversal is here. Um, right now, it just looks, feels, smells, acts like volatility. There's volatility in equities, there's volatility in currencies. But um, if a trend is to form form in the dollar uh, to the downside, I think you'd see equities find a more stable footing. In the meantime, we're going to continue to call it volatility. So 85% of companies have now reported their results for the third quarter. And revenue growth looks like it'll be about 11% year over year. Uh, earnings growth is about 4.3% year over year. And, and, I think that the fact that earnings outlook, which, you know, about four or five months ago were for $252 a share next year in the S&P, it's only come down to $233. So it's come down a bit. That's not, that's not very much, but um, that really represents a big unknown as to 
Uh, if the market's earnings next year are going to come down to 220 to 230, uh, you, you could argue a lot of this is already priced. If the market's earnings are going to drop to 200, then I suspect it probably has not. Uh, the 10-year bond yield closed at 4.22%. That was up six basis points on the day. Uh, the top uh, performance today that, you know, I'm used to such a reverse correlation between these two things, but communication services was up 1.83%. It's been getting walloped lately, as you know. And then energy, which has been rallying like crazy lately, it was right behind it at plus 1.73. So you had an in-favor and out-of-favor sector both have a good day. Uh, utilities, which have been more out of favor than in favor lately, they were down 1.94%. A lot of volatility in utilities at the moment. I have a chart at the DC today. I really want to make this point about the ESG movement. Um, what you see in the chart is just a massive inflow of new monies in 2020 and 2021 into ESG branded, ESG themed mutual funds and ETFs. Not even counting some of the like separately managed account and, and, and the uh, certain managed money programs, but just fund product. And, and you know, energy was down a lot in 20 and uh, big tech was up a lot in 20. And then now in 2022, the flows have just completely dried up and, and you see a lack of new money going in. Um, so for those who wonder if there's a sort of compensation premium around ESG, I think that the anecdotal evidence at this point in time is that it was really a marketing driven phenomena that had a strong performance backdrop rooted to connected to other things. And as the performance premium goes away, like so many things, it, it, then apparently the attraction does. A little more conventional financial services product than ideological innovation, it would appear. So uh, the elections are tomorrow. My final prediction, just so everyone can hate me, get mad at me or, or what, whatnot, is I do believe the Republicans will end up taking back the Senate. And I do believe that um, 52-48 is entirely possible. Um, if I wanted to be safer, I'd say 51-49, just what, what I mean by that is safety of my prediction. Um, but there's some odd things that are, are prevalent in some of the other polls. Now, you'll recall, I was thinking it would go the other way three, four months ago. And I think that a couple of the, the GOP's more concerning candidates ended up uh, righting the wrongs that were taking place in their campaign. Some people may still not like the candidates, but that's not at all my comment here. Um, I, I would just say that it, it you know, look, uh, most people are guilty of predicting along the lines of what they want. And, and I don't believe I'm guilty of that. I, I work very hard to maintain an objectivity. Um, I think that the way that the Republicans get to 52 and possibly 53 could end up surprising people. But um, look, there is a scenario which this is wrong and all these tight races break the other way. There's a scenario in which it's wrong and that it's even more robust that maybe New Hampshire um, and, and Arizona and Pennsylvania and Georgia all go Republicans way. Um, but I, I suspect that there will be a net pickup in Georgia and Nevada and that the Republicans will hold Wisconsin and Ohio and then, um, you know, I'm a little more unclear on both Pennsylvania and on Arizona. So that's where you could end up seeing it go a little more, a little less. Um, and I'm not bold enough to go call New Hampshire going the other way, but there's no question those polls tightened hugely in the last couple of weeks. And that's a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, but I'm writing on Wednesday morning more about what happened, uh, doing a bit of, it, you'll get it in the middle of the morning on Wednesday. I won't wait till after the market closes. Just whatever analysis I think I think is worthwhile and what trends we do see. There may be some races too close to call. For one thing, if neither candidate gets to 50% in Georgia on Tuesday night, then or you know, by the time these votes are done being counted on in Georgia, if they don't get to 50%, we have to do another runoff, as it took place in 2020. And so that could keep the whole thing going even longer. Um, on the House side, I think everybody is well expecting the Republicans to take the majority. And there's a debate as to whether or not it can be as low as only 15 seats or as much as 30 plus or something. So again, I'm just kind of taking that safe spot in the middle there and pointing out that there, there was such an odd amount of net pickups for Republicans in 2020 
that some of the normal midterm um, minority party success might have already happened two years in advance because of how well things went in House races for the Republicans two years ago. The thing I would say about the brand, about the, um, about, excuse me, the market, and it's funny, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, at my DC Today today, I notice I have a typo where I'm referring to the um, exec execution branch instead of the executive branch. And hopefully my, my team will, uh, <laughs> will correct that because I don't want to uh, refer to the executive branch of government as the execution branch and be accused of a uh, Freudian slip or people believing I'm, I'm hinting at something crazy. I really don't do crazy when I do politics and I wish more people could say the same. Um, yeah, the, the markets have known all year the House was likely moving Republican. The Senate, it, it could go one way or the other. I don't think markets rally a bit one way or the other on it just simply because you're still going to end up with divided government and you were going to have divided government anyways just by taking one of the two chambers. So more or less, I, I've advocated this all year that it wasn't an upside surprise, but it does stabilize things. It does take some risks and possibilities off the table. But yeah, for the most part, I think you, the markets have known this is coming and uh, we'll see exactly what it ends up being here in, in the next, uh, call it 36 hours. Uh, we know by now the jobs report on Friday, uh, 261,000 jobs were added, uh, more than expected, but the household survey saw a big loss of 328,000. And part of me is of the opinion that the markets are now responding to that mixed data, not only going to the BLS data, that until they see confirmation from two sort of conflicting surveys, it's hard to get a, a set theme as to what will happen and then what, what they therefore expect the Fed to do around it. Keep in mind that the China closing um, around COVID-related matters in so-called iPhone City, that it, Apple itself is warning of big uh, production halts. And so we wonder what uh, that impact could be overall for trade um, as we continue to go through the just utter um, silliness of, of China's locking down. Uh, there is a chart at DC today that I think is really important to this theme of an explosion of factory construction in the United States for electronics and for uh, computer parts, components. Um, again, it seems to me to reinforce a, a really big onshoring uh, trend that we're in early innings of, and, and that, that's a story we wanna keep watching. Pending home sales were down in September, 31% year over year. Uh, that's the, um, you know, with first, and by the way, um, that's the fourth month in a row. Only uh, first time home buyers are only 26% of home purchases this year. That's the lowest in 40 years. And that's clearly related to affordability. And uh, energy, uh, you can see the sector return since election day over two years since we last had a midterm election, energy up 237% and uh, most everything else either you know like communication services is down 19 consumer discretionary is down two this is after the huge up year of 21 and the big down year of 22 and then every other sector up somewhere between 10 and, and 20 percent but energy up 237 percent all right against doomsdayism let's just put it this way you had 20 million people dying of famines 150 years ago you uh, have seen the number reduced by 90, almost 98%. And if that doesn't argue against doomsdayism, then I don't know what does. Uh, someone asked me a question about central bank balance sheet and I gave a multi-paragraph answer. I won't rehash now. So again, I'll be writing uh, from uh, Nashville, Tennessee on Wednesday morning, a day after election summit, we will not do a DC Today podcast or video Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon as the entire team is flying out to Nashville um, on Wednesday and we'll be in our team uh, offsite meetings Thursday and Friday. We will have a Dividend Cafe Friday, but just be prepared for that minor adjustment to the schedule. So a normal DC Today tomorrow, Tuesday, election commentary coming written to your inbox Wednesday morning. And other than that, have a wonderful evening and reach out with any questions you may have anytime. Questions at thebonsongroup.com. 
Thank you for listening to and watching the DC Today.